Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. We have another conversation series for you, folks. Like I just looked at statistics, and you guys are these are well received, especially Webb and Ron, who are talking lighting controls on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. That's right. And so they're back again, and they're with Steve Mesh. So they're going to have a conversation. If you're in lighting, you know that name, Steve Mesh. So they're going to have a conversation with him without, about lighting controls. But before we let you get into that, you got to get crazy and you got to go to tcpi.com. Whoa, Greg's got a big lightsaber there. <laughs> Holy macaroni. tcpi.com, Greg Eric. That's right. So you know what I kind of dislike about lighting sometimes? Our color choices for people when they have to define what they want uh, ahead of time. And then you go onto the site and you say, okay, this is the color you told me. That's the color you had. Well, you actually had like three or four different colors and you just didn't know which one you liked. And now you don't like it. What do we got to do? We got to change everything. Or do you? With TCP, you don't, man. Color switch right on the tube itself. 35K, 4K, Amazing. 5K, type B, type A, single double-ended LED tube. Replace your fluorescence. Give yourself the option to pick the color you want today and tomorrow and a year from now. Easy. May the force be with you at TCP. That's a magic lightsaber right there. I love it. Go to tcpi.com. And you know, Greg, I know we have a convention. We're tying it all up with the Arclight Summit. It's going to be amazing. It's it's September 13th to 16th in Dallas, Texas. Go to nail.org to register. But you know what I want people to do? All you Nailed members out there, all those who, who should be joining Nailed, you need to get into Ellis Evolve, Greg. It's such an amazing Please. program. And... You know, the team here at Get a Grip Studios is putting out new LS Evolve modules all the time. It's absolutely in my, like just that top up every now and then just to learn about something new, experts from around the world. You got to join Nailed and get your people in LS Evolve. So go to NAILD.org. For right now, we got Ron and Webb and Steve coming in hot. All right, welcome to our next session on lighting controls talking. <laughs> I am the self proclaimed self-proclaimed lighting control specialist here with Ron Kuzmar, my assistant, and we are chatting with Steve. Now, Steve is really has been involved in the lighting world for a long time, um, and he's kind of an educator on lighting controls especially, and so that's why we brought him in here today to chat. But just so that our listeners or viewers get a, a little understanding of who you are and what you do, do you mind giving us a little elevator pitch for yourself? Sure. So um, I have been a lighting designer uh, since I started working for my instructor at Parsons School of Design, Jim Knuckles. That was a long time ago. I've been teaching since I had hair. I think at this point that's 38 <laughs> years ago. Um, and uh, I've taught in New York City area design schools for 20 years. I did a little guest lecture thing at Penn State at one point. Um, but I moved to San Francisco uh, and spent 13 years in San Francisco, a few of which were as the resident lighting expert at the Pacific Energy Center run by uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, and then for the past 10 years or so have been back to independent life doing a lot of things. Um, probably the most noteworthy of which in the past several years has been running classes on behalf of DLC and I'm doing lots of other things as well. So now uh, we can get into a little more detail about that, but that's a very brief recap of what I've been, what I've been up to since I had hair. That was a very long time ago. <laughs> Well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And, um, you know, as far as lighting controls education goes, you know, do you feel that um, there's an increase in knowledge, decrease, or has things have things kind of been staying the same for, you know, you kind of teach for DLC, which means you you cover a wide swath of different attendees who, who are working with you to learn something. So from your perspective as an educator, what are you seeing with the boots on the ground? perspective and knowledge. So, you know, the interesting thing, as I mentioned during my little summary, was that I taught in New York, New York City area design schools for literally 20 years, and then I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, forget it. The reason I made the switch to really dealing with almost exclusively working professionals is because the academic programs are stretched out for very long periods of time. And it's very hard to feel like, you know, we're making an immediate impact. Um, 
And that started to drive me crazy after 20 years. You know, it was great. I had great experiences, great students, worked for great schools. Um, but I wanted to see the direct link to how this impacted the market. So, you know, doing that in schools is really tough, right? So, you know, sure. the great school programs, I'm not knocking any of them. Um, so the, the position at uh, the Pacific Energy Center in San Francisco was great because those are all you know, half day or one day classes, maybe sometimes one hour webinars. So it's very easy to see the impact. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you guys something that you, I'm sure most, you guys probably don't know and probably no listeners would know either. Um, the energy centers in California uh, are mandated by law. They've been mandated by law mm -hmm. for about 40 years. Um, it's very unusual. And that's why those energy centers exist there. Uh, as you can imagine, it's hard to judge the effectiveness of those um, of, and because that's using ratepayer money to fund those, just like it funds the incentive programs, right? So, of course, they've commissioned uh, uh, companies to figure out what the effectiveness was. And there are reports that have shown that accounting for like five to 10% of the overall portfolio for energy efficiency programs. And PG&E is enormous. So mm -hmm. if, you know, Opinion Dynamics that ran that study said that that's account, that the energy centers alone and those classes are accounting to for a five to 10% increase in, you know, the efficiency of portfolio, that's incredible. That's mm -hmm. really incredible. Yeah. Um, so I've seen that firsthand. Um, you know, uh, the, the most noteworthy thing I've done in recent years is teaching this class for DLC, which I've literally done 60 times now, mm. including several times virtually during the lockdown. And uh, that covered, that's covered about a thousand students. And mm. I have a lot more to go. <laughs> Haven't done everybody in the entire world yet. But you're um, you're, what, you're essentially seeing a, a return on that investment rather quickly. And so mm -hmm. it's really fascinating how engaged people are with these because sometimes, you know, people go to these because they need continuing education credits or, or something like that. Right. And so you get those people who are just kind of snoozing in the background. But um, <clears throat> that that metric that you just cited, the five to 10 percent increase, it, that is phenomenal. Um, it's a big number. Yeah. And I mean, it, it may behoove the rest of the nation to follow that metric. You know, I know mm -hmm. some of the, the groups out here in the Northeast try to incentivize this. Um, but, you know, I wonder if perhaps that mandated that that by law requirement incentivizes it ever further. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, California is kind of a special case just because it's the most populous state, and it, it already was 40 years ago. You know, I grew up in New York, so for me, that was all the way across the country. But having said that, you know, because it's the most populous state, they knew a long time ago that they were going to end up in situations where they would have rolling blackouts and all this kind of stuff that came to pass 20 years ago. That's exactly what happened. So they already started planning for that long before that and they said hey we not only have to have incentives but we also have, have to have education and it's literally mandated by law for ious and investor-owned utilities um so you know by the way there are other things that i don't know if you guys know about maybe you do there are some incentive programs for does for lighting experts or you know lighting designers or electrical engineers you know whoever you know qualifies for this for example, yeah, you're referring to Vermont. rebate incentives where you have to have an expert involved. Right. To be so, able to get for example, that in Vermont, they instituted a program called Relight several years ago, specifically to incentivize designers because the, the, either the hypothesis or what they actually proved, I don't know which one, was that if you actually hire somebody who is, you know, doing this every day and really knows what they're doing, uh, the likelihood is you'll achieve greater energy savings, and that's why they incentivized it. So that's been repeated in other places. The other thing that I wanted to mention that I think you'll find interesting is that the, the DLC thing is so great because as a data set, you know, I have 60 classes and I have a lot of data from that. One of which is that I have actually taught that class about 15 of those 60 times in one state in the Midwest. 
And the reason that I've taught that class 15 times in that state in the Midwest is because they have an incentive program that is going like gangbusters. So they, you know, and what incentive pay- program is that? Um, so it, uh, uh, controls incentive program. Okay. Lighting so they, place. they're incentivizing controls. And as a result, there's a higher demand for education on controls. Right. It's just working directly hand in hand. You know? so, so, so basically uh, a way to address one of the issues that's happening in our, in our country and in, in the North, North American area because a lot of people are having issue with lighting controls either because of lack of knowledge or or awareness is to go from the state and incentivize knowledgeable people to be involved in projects which i think is great and and the fact that you're seeing at least as an educator a increased demand on this information is Mm -hmm. proof that this works and addresses right, right. a major concern in our country. Right. I mean, the fact that, you know, the, the way this works is that the uh, participating utility, which is a constituent of DLC, pays DLC for me to come fly somewhere and teach this class. So it's not free, right? Mm-hmm. So if they're paying for it and they've paid for it repeatedly 15 times, there's a reason for it, right? Right. So for, you know, just anecdotally, I'll just tell you that, um, well, let me back up for a minute. One of the things that we do in these classes and that I've done a lot in other venues as well, like light fair. And uh, in fact, the very first time I ever did this was in Sacramento because they had a million dollars. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, This was literally 10 years ago. And they said, hmm, how about if we incentivize some network lighting controls installations, and they paid up to $100,000 per project for up to 80% of the project costs. So that really got the ball rolling. And that's the first time that I actually taught uh, classes in network lighting control systems, network lighting control systems, um, which was basically hands-on. So over two days, attendees, you know, I, I bored them to death with lecture for about two hours, but literally the rest of the two days was them wiring up three network lighting control systems. And by the way, these weren't the newer simple systems. These were the older complex systems, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and they did it under my supervision. You know, they managed to wire up some pretty sophisticated systems in two days. It was remarkable. And, you know, by the way, to your previous point, in these utility classes, because they're funded by ratepayers, it means that they have to open the doors to anybody. They're not allowed to say, you have to have this prerequisite or you can only be a contractor. You know, so it could be literally anyone. And in fact, in one, in that very first class I did in Sacramento, there was some issue with one of the three systems that we had. And this lady who happened to be an interior designer of all things, sat down at the computer figured out what the problem was and solved the problem for the network lighting control system. She wasn't an electrical engineer and she wasn't an electrical contractor. Wow. So um, the message, you know, the whole point of these classes is to demystify because people Mm -hmm. think it's very complex stuff. So in uh, next month, I will actually be speaking at a conference in Minneapolis. And we decided that the title of my one hour talk is going to be lighting controls, not rocket science. <laughs> because it's not. It's really not. You know, it's, well, but it's, I think it's the, not the most complicated thing I've ever done. The impression that a lot of people still have with lighting controls is that it is rocket science, and I'm wondering exactly. how we are able to break that expectation because of the fact. And I think it's great that you're doing these hands-on courses that give people a, a realistic perspective of what these devices are. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, on a greater whole, you know, how do we get the majority of our industry to realize that this isn't as difficult as they may think it is? So that's a very interesting question. We could have a days long philosophical discussion (laughs) about it. But I'll I'll give you my quick take on that. Just literally right off the bat. No, go for it. One of the things that we did when I developed the DLC class contents with somebody who 
was at DLC, is now at Pacific Northwest National Labs, a very smart guy, is that was that happened to be right around the time that these new, what we're calling simplified systems, started coming out. Um, you know, you, you know what they are. I won't name names right now, but, you know, there are many of the major lighting controls manufacturers realized that, you know, to date, they only had these fairly complex systems that, let's see, they required a factory startup, which already meant, you know, more expense, and you had to schedule it, you had to wait, so forth and so on. You know, they had to check stuff, right? Uh, uh, they had to program it, you know, they had to commission it, program it, set it up, and so forth and so on. If you made any changes, they had to do it. Um, and then they, I think they realized that there are a lot of bells and whistles, there are a lot of great, pro, a lot of great systems out there, but it's probably more than a lot of projects need, and it's complex. So what we did is we created these buckets that we've talked about in the, in the you know, presentations where we say simplified versus comprehensive. And the reason we say comprehensive is we didn't want to say complex or complicated mm -hmm. because that has a negative connotation. But you know, between us, you know, they, they are, they're more complex and complicated, right? So that was, a, that was great timing. And all of a sudden, you know, we had these new simplified systems that were pretty easy to deal with. And, you know, people are, people are pretty blown away by that when they see those in the class. And I bring one, so they wire it and they program it. They see it's just not a big deal. So how, how do you feel? Look, so with the simplified systems, right? So how, how do we increase education to the electrical contractors who are out there installing these, right? Because a lot of times those simplified systems are not being put in by an integrator like myself. They're being done by that mm -hmm. electrical contractor. And mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time in this, at least here in the Northeast, we spend a lot of time going back in after the fact to clean those mm -hmm. systems up and redo programming because there's just simply not enough education, even though it is a simple system for the electrical yeah. contractor to properly program the system. Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. Well, one of the things that I'm actually working on right now, actually, kind of coincidentally, um, in a number of different ways, I'm, I'm actually developing some new classes, uh, not that won't be through DLC separate. Um, and I also, by the way, just wrote an interesting blog post for the Lighting Controls Association. I've been doing that for several years. The most recent one that I wrote is probably the most complex and probably the lengthiest blog post I've ever written, but it's on the subject of zoning and code requirements. And the reason that I'm bringing that up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harp on that a little bit more in classes, we specifically didn't formally address that in the DLC class contents because the thought process at the time was, well, this is kind of supposed to be geared just towards contractors. And um, by the way, I didn't mention this before, but one of the things that I, that I did as soon as I got to San Francisco is I got sucked right into the development team for the CALCTP, the California Advanced Lighting Controls Training Program, that actually got an award for the worst acronym of the year that year. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, but that program, you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with that program. So that's a great program. Um, they're trying to push that nationally and so forth, but it's it's a whole big complicated thing. And and I'm not in, I haven't been involved with that for like ten years now. So you know I'm I'm dealing with the DLC stuff. You know I'm I'm taking advantage of other opportunities to do this besides that. And um, so you know similarly, the idea was hey you know let's hit contractors first because contractors are often on the front line, right? So you know. Um, the, the idea with DLC, when I started to develop this in conjunction with the guy from DLC was, you know, same thing, like we want to hit contractors first and contractors um, don't deal with, you know, code issues, that's, elect that's in the purview of the electrical engineer. But of course that's a little silly because obviously if you're uh, an owner and you you're like look up in the phone book, you're like, hey, I want to do an energy efficiency project, let's, let's call a local contractor. That contractor is the de facto specifier anyway. So uh, to me, that's a little silly. You know, that's a silly distinction, right? <laughs> but any, but I don't want to sound disparaging of that. It's great stuff. But uh, um, but the code, re but every single DLC class that I've taught, somebody asks about code requirements. 
So, and you know, these are not all electrical engineers. So it shows you they know, right? The reason I'm bringing that up, as boring as code requirements sound, is that <laughs> you have to comply with them if you're doing a code compliant project, right? So, you know, th there are intricacies about that. Um, and the, the blog post that I just wrote on the Lighting Controls Association goes into pretty major detail about it. Yeah. It's a complex issue and it's hard to explain without graphics. It's a lot easier to explain with graphics, and I'm creating content right now for new classes that will show that. But you know, there's a there's a philosophical issue that's tricky that I've talked about with clients before. Um, one of the things that a lot of people have wanted to do, whether it's DLC, the CALCTP guys in California, whether it's NIA, North Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance you know, all these different groups, all the conversations that I've had for years now is, you know, we want to make this stuff sound simple. We want to demystify it and make it seem easy. One of the things that I say when I start teaching a lot of these classes is that these are systems and by definition systems are complex. So I can say that it's simple all day long, but the fact of the matter is even by definition they're complex. Sure. So then what I say in the classes, and if anybody ever who watches this takes a class, they're, they're they're going to see the punchline before I say it in person. But what I say is we have two options. The first is cry for your mommy. Second is suck it up and learn it. So the, the philosophical <laughs> issue to me is do we want to make this so simple that we don't get into any discussion of any of the detail on all of the great stuff that these things do, right, or can do, whether we use them or not, the features or not, or do we want to get into some of that stuff and give people the feeling that when they come they're to these educational offerings, they're getting value, right? Mm -hmm. It's value added. Well, and, and that's, I mean, that's a philosophical I, argument, you know. Absolutely. I, I think that, that that brings up a really interesting point about, you know, the, the concept of energy code as well, because energy code for the purposes of what it's trying to do is just reducing wasted energy but mm -hmm. in inherently by becoming obfuscated because of how complex it is there's some challenges there to be compliant with with the energy code and additionally mm -hmm. there are jurisdictions that will ignore energy code either because their inspectors aren't capable of inspecting to that or the code requires something that doesn't exist yet and the manufacturer or they have, have home rule and they don't care Right. Or that. And so, you know, as a as a country, as a state, as a jurisdiction, you know, there's a big hurdle. And I think part of the, the, the plus to having people like you who are educating people on these systems and how to be code compliant helps bolster the the foundation of what energy code is trying to do without people right. being educated in how this works. It, it does right. kind of go by the wayside. And so, you know, I, I read that article, by the way, it was very well done. I think, you know, um, it really helps communicate some of the things that other groups that try to communicate, especially, you know, there are manufacturers that will do the graphics, but they'll make it product specific. They'll say, okay, you know, our occupancy sensor paired with our power pack will meet this compliance requirement of ASHRAE, right. whereas, right. Trying to be agnostic is is really tricky, especially because each manufacturer has their own lineup. So I think having information that you're providing is really crucial to the success. And so targeting contractors with that information is hard because a lot of this mm -hmm. information is also aimed towards the engineers or the designers in general. Right. So. I, I agree with the mentality of, of targeting the contractors first and then going after the the designers second. But I think as a result, you know, if we don't capture all the contractors with that information, there will still be a wide swath of, of missed opportunity. Yeah, and I, we really kind of need to take it one step further than that too, right? So I can't tell you how many systems we go into and regardless of what the code is, right? You will set it up to code. You will get it signed off. You will do everything. And then six months later, the end user will call you and say, I hate this. 
fix it mm -hmm. and they tell you what they want and you reprogram it to what they want and you bypass half the controls because that's what they want and no matter how much you talk to them about it they 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 will rip it out before they will you know abide by it so how do we sort of take the education that next step further and get people to understand you know why the code is there and why the controls are important so that the end users don't just rip it all out that's an interesting topic for discussion. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of us lighting professionals, as you guys know, have a real love-hate relationship with energy codes because, uh, so, you know, fortunately, I don't work for the California Energy Commission or for ASHRAE or any, you know, any other code writing organization. Um, and, you know, most of us, typically bemoan the fact that codes are written in what's often seems like fairly cryptic language and uh, weird weird stuff you know we could we could talk about that for days but the the intent is certainly obvious to me i mean i understand the intent you know it's to save energy what i've seen by tracking code stuff over the years because i've had to teach it so of course i have to be familiar with it on an ongoing basis what i've seen over the years, which is pretty interesting, even just in the 13 years I was in San Francisco, is that there, you know, are, are always changes in every three year, you know, long update cycle um, based on new technology. I mean, just as an example, uh, the uh, LPD limit for open office spaces used to be 2.4 watts per square foot in 1989. That was based on T12 fluorescent lamps. You know, now in California, it's 0.75. So that's like a third, right? Why? Well, because now everything's LED and the, the, and the densities are lower for the same light output, right? So there are reasons for it. With controls, you know, there, there's something that's very significant that happened with controls in terms of codes recently. That's another really perfect example of that, which is that both in IECC, which many states in the country use, and in Title 24 in California, there's new verbiage that limits the size of control zones in open offices to 600 square feet. You know, in ASHRAE, it's 5,000 square feet, 5,000, right? So what, what I can see in terms of the code is that what they're doing is they're writing verbiage that's trying to get us to fixed or integrated or LLLC, but they, those probably don't yet meet payback hurdles, which is the whole process they go through, you know, to vet something to put it into the code. So the weird thing is that now we, you know, that you could see where they're moving, and I appreciate that they're doing that. But it's like, oh boy, you know, like you're not quite there yet. But um, some of these codes do have, let's say, alternate compliance paths for things like using LLCs because they know they're out there; they're all over the place, right? And every vendor makes controls that can be installed with fixed or integrated controllers and sensors anyway, right? So um, one, one of the things that I think might speak to the question you asked more directly is that um, um, uh, it's, uh, one of the things that I've thought about a lot over the past several years is that there's a lot of great equipment out there, but some of which is at a quite a bit lower level than network lighting control systems. So for example, room-based system. So, you know, room-based controllers are often these 20 amp devices that have three relays. And that, you know, in the, in, you know, up until now, you could potentially do a whole bunch of different types of spaces. You might do a classroom that actually does have to have a primary daylight zone and a secondary daylight zone and a non-daylight zone, right? That's perfect. What happens if you put a chalkboard fixture in? Now you need a fourth relay, but those devices usually only have three, right? So it really shows you the limitations and you can't see all of them at the same time unless you use some kind of network bridge to bridge them all together. Well, you know, and add a server. Well, now all of a sudden you have what's essentially a network, network lighting control system. So, the th so one of the things that I've tried to do in these classes is to get people to realize that if they just make that jump in their head to a real system, you know, a building-wide system, that eliminates all of that complexity. And, you know, the funny thing is that 
if you install that in your building, especially if you're using fixed or integrated stuff, so everything has its own address and centers anyway, then it's just a matter of programming. So that already eliminates a lot of the complexity. So all of the code stuff that I addressed in that recent blog post, you could basically say, forget it, I don't have to read it anymore, because now I know I can do anything I need, because I can group any group of fixtures together, right? Well, and um, and I think, you know, there's there's two kind of worlds that are colliding with this mentality that you're talking about, because in one regard, there are certainly engineers or designers out there who are doing a, a full integrated system where every single luminaire has its own controller pre-installed in it as a as a point to not only meet code, but also give the end user complete control over their system. But mm -hmm. they may not actually dictate in their specifications what the goal is, how things are going to be programmed. And so there may be some extra commissioning in the end. But additionally, there there's pushback from the other side of where people are saying, whoa, that's that's too expensive, it's too complicated, it's too labor intensive on the commissioning end. I just want my system to function how it's always functioned, where it's just relays and time clocks. And I don't wanna think about the, the zoning stuff that's coming out through energy code. And so how do we reconcile these two frames of mind? That's, that's the hard part. You know, it's, I can tell you anecdotally something that's interesting one of the things that i heard in one of the classes in michigan which was the midwestern state that i was talking about before um, we overheard some people who were off to the side and not participating in our hands-on wiring exercise of the wireless lighting control system that i brought for them to wire and commission and when one of my colleagues went over and so he was in earshot what he heard is that the reason they were over there talking by themselves is that what they were saying to each other in private was, this is amazing and we have to install this in every project. Mm -hmm. We didn't provoke that, right? They were doing that right. on their own. That, that was really amazing. So the, you know, the, the power of this as an educational offering is that you know, it's demystifying. And the reason I bring the equipment is that I can say it all day long. It's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm asking people to believe me. You know, even my own mother doesn't always believe me, right? <laughs> but when we bring the equipment and they wire it and they commission it and it works and it's worked every single time. I've never, ever, ever in the, you know, almost so, 100 times that it's never been an issue. So what you're trying so to like, say wow. here is that it's a lack of awareness and education that's really driving the second group that's saying, I don't want this complex system. I just want, you know, what I've always right. had. So right. really, but you know, to, no, go but, ahead. You know, to, but to, to Ron's point, you know, one of the, one of the things I'm not really harping on is this issue of once you have a system or once you've committed to having a system, um, <clears throat> you know, you've made a decision at some point to say, okay, I'm gonna have this or I do have it or I've already spent the money. And then the question is what, what then, then what? You know, once the equipment is in place and the, the whole issue of then what, that's a really big question because, you know, I, I feel like I've been able to do a reasonably good job of bringing people to the trough, right? Not necessarily dunking their heads in the water and drinking it. But, um, you know, it's very compelling when you've done it yourself in the class and you're like, oh, my God, like, you know, the, there are all sorts of people who come to these classes, right? There are a lot of contractors, but there are a lot of people who are not. There are some people who literally get, never wired anything. Do you ever get owners or any, any end users in your classes? Yeah, mm -hmm. or representatives, people like that. Yeah, occasionally, yes. And yes. what's their take on everything? Well, it's, you know, different kinds of people. I mean, some people, some of the people have been like, quote unquote, energy experts. You know, if you say that you're an energy expert, that could be anything, right? There's no legal definition. There's no licensing for that. So it's, but, you know, like the story I told you guys before about the lady who's an interior designer, you know, trust me, interior designers and even architects are not, you know, taught to be experts in lighting, right? You, you made a great point there um, that I hadn't considered before. O owners reps, right? That's 
training the end users, you're only going to get so far, right? I think about all these schools and office buildings and you, you, you know, these people come and go and, but the owner's mm -hmm. rep is there and it's a lot of, so a lot of times, right? The electrical contractor finishes the installation, they disappear. The integrator mm -hmm. comes and goes, they'll call whoever to come back in and reprogram fine. The GC is long gone, never going to hear from them again, unless there's a warranty <coughs> issue, right? I mean, that's just yep. the way it goes, but the owner's rep, is there and they're there post project so if if we could get more owners reps to understand these systems i think that would help a lot with mm -hmm. keeping the systems in place after the fact and keeping that education because they can be sort of that frontline boots on ground as to why it was installed this way because they were on for the whole project duration mm -hmm. and then trying to keep it maintained through you know a longer duration so i, I think that's a great place to really start and focus on more education so actually you know we're we're talking about quote unquote owners reps but actually it occurred to me that there's really another job title which is equally important or maybe even more important which is quote unquote facility managers mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so you know for example ifma is the international facilities manager facility managers association um, I've got actually given a talk for the San Francisco chapter of IFMA because the president was the lady who worked at PG&E actually, but that's um, so that's a that's a really important group. In fact, I was a contributing editor to Building Operating Management magazine, which is a trade journal, but it's geared towards facility managers. So when you read some of those articles, you know you might be like, well, I could see this is sort of geared towards facility managers. But it's still the same great information that you would get anywhere else. It's just they're they're trying to gear it to facility managers. You know, I will also tell you, by the way, pursuant to that issue, um, I actually worked on a project at one of the University of California campuses uh, where they installed a wireless control system in 2013, which I not only specified, but I also commissioned it because you know I've I, I've already. I had already been using these things in classes anyway. So I'm like, yeah, it's not rocket science. I'll, I'll learn all the gory details of how this system works. And you know, this, um, so the, the, the facilities people were the ones who hired me. That was my actual client. There was no architect, there was no electrical engineer. They had, a, you know, in-house electricians who did the work. It was just simple stuff. They actually didn't even change the fixtures, which they'll probably never do that again. They actually put a wireless control system into existing fluorescent fixtures, but it did work and they saved like 75 to 80 percent of the energy. Um, I've had access to the server all this time and I go back and check and it's still saving 75 to 80 percent, largely because of how I programmed it. So I took it, I show people this in classes because I fortunately I still have remote access and I pull that up and, and that was not one of the newer simplified systems. For example, it allows for nested zoning. So as an example, we have 20 foot runs of five, four foot T8 fixtures. Three of those segments are in the daylight zone because they're close enough to the window and the other two are not. Well, guess what? That means it's a little complex that, you know, the way they had to wire it, they have to have different sensors, and, and but the switch turns the whole thing on or off, right? So that's an automatically nested zoning. There are a lot of simplified systems that don't have that feature. They don't allow for nested zoning because they're like, hey, you know, like we don't need nested zoning in a classroom, right? And um, just for our so, listeners out there, nested zoning refers to where you have a zone that's a sub zone of a bigger zone so that you can control right. the whole zone of, of these sub zones together. But then you can also right. individually control the sub zones. Um, right. So but I want to you know, throw a yeah. curveball to you um, because, sure. you know, this is all really great stuff. I, I wish I could say, let's just have Steve Mesh teach the nation, get everybody knowledgeable so that lighting controls can be done well. But there's a challenge in at America right now that is really problematic. And that is that the, the designers for systems are 90% of the time the sales reps, mm -hmm. which means that it's a proprietary perspective 
on the design of the system. So how do we how do we overcome that challenge where, you know, yes, the electrical engineer or the lighting designer is responsible for the, the holistic function of the system, but the, the person who's doing the detail work is ultimately probably going to be the sales rep or the manufacturer themselves. So how do we overcome that challenge in the sense of achieving a across the board education for everybody? If, if, if everything's so proprietary still. That's a really interesting question. And that's something that, you know, I've grappled with, with any of these efforts that I've been involved with for, you know, 10, 15 years now, it's very, very tricky. So for example, with the CAL CTP program in California, that was a very serious concern, just as it was when I developed the DLC class. And the reason is that they wanted the CAL CTP program to be extremely robust so that they could go to the California Energy Commission and say, hey, we have this extremely robust program. We have these checks and balances and we give people tests and we keep all these records and they, they pay a company a lot of money to do that, <laughs> believe me. The whole point of that was to be able to say, hey, we've got this robust agnostic program where, yes, we use actual stuff. They Basically, the way that works is that they have a half-day lecture followed by a half-day in the lab, and they do that five days in a row. And, you know, they wire up a lot of actual equipment, right? But they work, we worked very hard to make sure that that was not just focused on one manufacturer, for example, right, different types of equipment. You know, in the DLC class, same thing. Like, if I create a even just a simple PowerPoint presentation, even if it's just for a one hour lecture at a conference, like my lighting controls, not rocket science talk, I'm going to give in Minneapolis in April. I still have to really concentrate all the time on making sure it's agnostic. You know, if I use actual, uh, you know, if I pull out a photo from manufacturer's website to say, here's a controller or whatever it is, you know, sen integrated sensor, I can't just have that one, you know, I have to have more, right? There's also an issue of um, interoperability, right? And, you know, open standards and so forth. So um, coincidentally, I just had a talk with the manufacturer yesterday who told me about a new Zaga book uh, that I don't know how many listeners would know what that is, but that's a standard for, you know, uh, uh, standardizing how components work uh, so that you could have uh, fixed or integrated sensors, you know, coming, you know, attaching to just standard sockets so that, mm -hmm. but that would have to be interchangeable right now with, right. you know, a lot of vendors, the signal coming from an integrated sensor may or may not work with somebody else's system, unless it's, let's say, Dolly, you know, something that's an open standard. But that's been, a, that's been a very tough nut to crack. You know, there, there are industries where that's very common, where they expect that, and there are industries where they, they've been fighting it tooth and nail, and this happens to be one of them. So right, I mean, yeah. the, the best I can do on my own, and I would love to be joined by as many people who want to join me as possible, but you know, what I've been doing for a long time is to just do the best job I can do with agnostic educational materials, mm -hmm. but it's also really important to me to actually do stuff hands-on. Sure. Uh, by the way, one of the things that we've been doing for a while now in San Francisco for my former employer, the Pacific Energy Center, is to create a series of manufacturers demos, which we're now getting in video form and they're hoping to create a library. So the idea is that we're trying to manage the way people see that instead of, you know, they're presented by manufacturers or by reps, but I'm being very clear with them about the fact that I don't want you to call this a POW pack, I want you to call it a controller, because that's the generic term that I would use. Right. I, I'm not sure how much more I can do, but I'm really pushing as hard no, as I can. No, but I, I, I think you really, I can. you really bring up an excellent point from an educational standpoint. It adds further complexity and difficulty for your job to have all these proprietary requirements that each manufacturer functions very differently from each other. You know, if, right. if I were doing theatrical work where DMX is the standard requirement for communication, it would be very easy. I'd just say DMX. Well, DMX 512, technically some people are going to beat me over the head, but, right. um, <laughs> so. I was going to say that, but. 
<laughs> outside of theater in the architectural world with lighting controls we have everybody and their mom has has their own standard their own protocol and so as a result you can't address it directly you just say communication <laughs> protocol but the problem also is that we have dimming protocols we have network protocols we have integration protocols and oh, yeah. you know to to ron's defense that's part of his job to to manage all this this faff that's going on in in the industry but from your standpoint as an educator it makes it so much harder to be able to communicate clearly well you know um that's a very interesting uh issue because when you bring up things like dmx oh sorry i mean dmx 512 um <laughs> when you you know when you bring up stuff like dmx i mean i will tell you uh for say you know anecdotally that I actually haven't ever done a project using DMX protocol. Interesting. Not ever, just because, you know, that's very specialized and you use it for very particular kinds of purposes. And I've, I just haven't had a client uh, for doing that. You know, I, 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 I haven't done, you know, pure lighting design stuff in, you know, for the most part in quite a while. So, you know, if I did a lot of that these days, I probably would have occasion to do something with the DMX system. But recently I haven't. If you, if, if we go back to um, this issue of these quote unquote simplified systems, which I would argue have all come out the past five to six years, right? Started right when we started developing the DLC class. Um, you know, what I tell people in classes is that they really all do basically more or less the same things. You know, they all have controllers. There may be different amperages, right? But they all have controllers. Um, the controllers have relays and they have dimming circuits, you know, that's what they do. You know, they have photo sensors, they have aux sensors, they have switches. They all pretty much do the same thing. The really big difference besides the little differences in equipment is in the software. And that gets back to what Ron brought up before, because that's where the issue is of that's where you do the programming. You're not doing the programming on the hardware, right? You're doing the programming on the software. And, you know, there are a lot of similarities in software because, of course, they have these, these systems all have to do some of the same things. And then maybe they add their own bells and whistles or they have their own ways of doing things. You know, some systems allow for nested zoning. Some systems don't, for example. I mean, I'll just throw it, just to make it really concrete, let me just throw out one really quick example of that. The system that I have been using for all these DLC classes so far, uh, because it's the first stuff that I happen to get my hands on, is a wireless control system that's that's simplified. And originally, if I had people in the classes wire up two sets of lights to represent a primary daylight zone and a secondary daylight zone, I needed two photo sensors so that they could assign one to each. Turns out, after I started using the equipment, the manufacturer changed the software to allow you to have nested zoning, but only for the photo sensor, so that you could do both, taking the signal from one photo sensor, and now you just cut down your photo sensor cost by 50%, right? So, you know, like, that's a little wrinkle that they have that they didn't have originally, but they realized, like, hey, like, we're forcing people to buy two photo sensors, and that's, you know, going around a whole office, like, that could be a lot of photo sensors, right? So, you know, it's, it's little differences like that. But again, like all, of, but this, my point is that these newer simplified systems all more or less do the same stuff, right? They're, they're not extraordinarily complex systems that have all these bells and whistles that, you know, most people probably don't need for most projects. But um, yeah, that's a real, that's a real issue of what's going on when people install these systems at whatever level they are and you know maybe you know maybe somebody's written out a complex sequence of operations originally because in a lot of places they're supposed to by code anyway it doesn't mean they always do uh, maybe they don't you know who knows but at any rate when you see that there's a mismatch between how it's been set up originally and what happens after the fact that's a that's a problem um, but that's why the the exposure to how these work and what they do or what they can do, I think is really important, uh, especially for people like facilities, people, owners, reps, anybody actually associated with the owner. The, 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 there's, a, there's a real disconnect. One of the reasons that I've moved away, largely moved away from doing pure lighting design 
is that there's often a disconnect and you know Webster you know I'm sure having worked in the same kind of profession there's a disconnect between what people on the design side know and do and expect to do for the owner and what the actual occupants do there's not always a disconnect but oftentimes there is and it's just because of the way it's structured where we have the you know design team you have the co contractor team the one group who's never automatically in there is the owner or the occupants right so it's like wow like that's kind of crazy right so i've worked on projects where we've actually seen how systems were used over time i worked on a research project in new york city as a consultant to lawrence berkeley labs where we looked at that because yeah it's kind of crazy if you're going to spend this that kind of money and then they're either going to rip it out or disable things that's nuts and we don't want yeah. people to help you have a big company that has a lot of facilities we really don't want to do that we want them to use this all the time in every project you know how, how do we get to a point where the lighting control so doing a lot with dmx 512 and streaming acn and artnet and all those other theatrical sort of protocols right we can use a lot of different parts and pieces from different manufacturers but a lot of these other systems these, these sort of simplified systems are very much manufacturer specific right the programming mm -hmm. is the software how do we get to a point where the at least the communication protocols right regardless of the software where the communication protocols are a little bit more open source so like we do um you know we've unfortunately had to rip out some systems recently for clients who only installed them five to seven years ago, but the manufacturer no longer supports wow. the equipment and it's gone out and the company's gone out of business. And now they, they, they can't even replace the pieces. They've got to rip out the entire system and start over because nothing else will communicate with it. So how do we get to a point where they're at least using some sort of open protocol to communicate so that if you have, you can replace a panel with someone else's, you can replace a sensor with someone else's that's, you know, will actually communicate. That's tough just because a lot of in this industry just seems to be very resistant to, you know, wanting to change from proprietary to not proprietary. But the, you know, but, but I'll also tell you guys one of the, uh, I'm not sure I should be mentioning brand names specifically, but there's a very large lighting manufacturer and controls manufacturer that's worldwide, a giant, giant one that uh, makes a dolly system that I've used in classes. And uh, so I have to, I have to tell you a very interesting anecdote about this one. So in our country, I know you guys know that dolly is a bad word. And that's really bizarre. Uh, it's there's no real great reason for it. I know there are reasons for it. They're not good reasons for it. They're stupid reasons for it. Right. But um, around the world, what these guys told me when they gave me this equipment to use in the classes is um, that around the world, they sell this equipment all over the place. It happens to be the system that's used in the Burj Khalifa, <laughs> tallest building in the world. Nobody around the world has any problem with it. It just has a bad, Dolly has a bad name here. And Dolly's an you know, open source, right? Open protocol. And why do, you, um, why do you think that is? Do you have any speculation? Maybe around the world, there are less, you know, the electrical industry is less, you know, resistant to non-proprietary stuff. I'm not really completely sure, but, it, but you know, for some reason, when Dolly kind of arrived in the United States 20 to 25 years ago, there were people who had bad experiences with it because, you know, it was kind of new stuff and it was a little complicated. Uh, I mean, I went to an art school and I figured out how to use it on my own. You know, it's not that complicated, believe me. But, you know, you have to do things like enumerate the fixtures. It's a little, it's, it's definitely more complicated than the newer simplified wireless systems. Believe me, it is. You know, sure. but it's nothing that anybody could not figure out how to use. Um, but the... Uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is that what's interesting is that I've seen that Dolly is sort of making a resurgence now. For example, there are manufacturers that are making sensors that are uh, that talk Dolly to a controller because it's so easy and it can, you know can transmit so many things back and forth based on the Dolly protocol. You know, so um, I've so the and a quick anecdote that I wanted to tell you guys about this, which is really interesting, is that literally the first time I did a hands-on 
network control system class was that class in Sacramento in 2012. And one of the people who came was a guy who was an electrician working for DGS, Department of General Services, for California. That's why he was in Sacramento. So I actually, I asked for Dolly stuff from this vendor because I knew they made this really incredible Dolly system and I wanted people to see what this was about. Or, or actually, I'm sorry, I asked for zero to 10 controllers. I didn't ask for Dolly. They gave me some Dolly controllers in addition. So these were 60 amp devices with three relays. So it meant that the zero to 10 controllers, we could only have three switch legs coming out, right? Just it's like a room controller, just happens to be 60 amp. The Dolly controllers were also, I think, 60 amp. Um, but guess what? It had three Dolly universes of 64 addresses each. That was 192 addresses. And when I explained that, the, the this electrical contractor who was on staff with the Department of General Services, not only did these guys wire it and go through the entire programming under my supervision, it was a little complex, but yeah, they, they made it through. It's not that big of a deal. And he was like, wow, this is amazing. Like we have the extra wiring going through to our switch boxes and stuff. Like we could send this to, you know, uh, this system switches because it has the four wires that we need. And could we, could we actually do this like right now? Like he was so psyched because of the power of that and that's only because it was dolly if it was the irony if it's is if it was zero to ten he wouldn't have been able to do that so it just shows you like wow like once people understand it and you demystify it and you get out of this realm of well this vendor says this and this proprietor it's like whoa that's pretty powerful stuff you know no, he didn't have any problem with the fact that dolly was open source or you know complex like he's like whoa i like what i can do with this you know so but that's I mean, what just we're, that's what we're trying to address you know Right. So just to encapsulate everything we've been talking about here today, you know, really the the crux of the matter in our in our country is education and awareness. And it seems as though from your experience, the more people you educate on this and on the capabilities of lighting controls, the better, the, the more willing they are to accept it. And not only that, but excited at times to install it and program it and utilize it. And so I wonder, you know, this is, this is for the greater question in our industry is if everybody knew what they needed to know about lighting controls, would we still be having the issues we're having right now? Would we still have the, from design through commissioning challenges that really slow down a project, prevent owner satisfaction, would we still have these issues? And and I would postulate based on the information you're giving me that no, we would we would be in a much better place and not only that, be much more capable of adopting energy code. And so, you know, I think the 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 question to our viewers or listeners is you know how do we encourage people like Steve Mesh to be more active more engaged and how do we encourage people to attend these more regularly mm -hmm. and one of the th things you brought up was um, you know incentives monetary incentives maybe that is the answer to the question and if we do increase incentives maybe we will get more people educated and as a result have a much better work a much better industry when it comes to lighting controls could be right that's what a lot of these programs have tried to do the chipping away here chipping away there trying to get to that ultimate goal yeah absolutely yeah. ron any any final thoughts yeah, I mean, you know, education is huge here, right? That's the big thing. But, you know, we really need to, you know, however it needs to come down from the top, right? But we need to find a way to get these manufacturers to pull their heads out of their butts and understand that, right? It, it needs to be a little bit, it needs to be more open source. You need to be able to, mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't, I shouldn't have to turn around to a client five years after they install the system and say, I'm sorry, the manufacturer stopped supporting this. I can't get parts and pieces. You're going to have to rip it out and install something else. It, you shouldn't have to do that. When someone spends that kind of money on a system, it, it, that should not be the answer. And, you know, we can do all the education and programming that we want and get the end users to understand. But we really need the manufacturers to step up here and understand that there is a more holistic problem 
uh, right? Starting with them, that if everything was open source, uh, you know, it'd make it a lot easier. But it also, I think, would allow everyone to get in on more projects, right? If like DMX systems, you can use manufacturer A and manufacturer B and manufacturer C on the same project because you like this light better, you like that thing better. That would start to open up a whole another world for these other manufacturers as well because they'd start to get in on more projects. It wouldn't be just this guy or just that gorilla or who, right? It, that's, they need to, that needs to happen. That has to happen somehow. Well, and also to, to Steve's defense, it would make his job easier. Yeah, to, absolutely. to have this consistency. So, of course, but it's you know that's such a tough thing because uh, I, I can, I could hope for that all day long, but you know <laughs> I can't change that for the entire industry. You know the industry has been like that for a long time, and I think most people yep. who've been around our industry know that. They, I hear people talk about that all the time. You know, if I go to Light Fair, I guarantee I'll have here at least one to ten <laughs> conversations on that subject at Light Fair. I yep. guarantee it. So it's, um, I'm not extraordinarily hopeful about that changing very rapidly, you know, overnight. No. Um, but um, I'm just trying to chip away at it by do, when I do this educational stuff, the irony is that I have to, in order to do hands-on activity, I have to use real equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so that's automatically proprietary. I can't do anything about it. So I can, you know, I can address you know, I can say like, okay, well, this is the way these guys do this, and this is the way this piece of equipment works. Okay, that's fine. And you know, by the by, the time we're done, whether I'm using just the one system in a one day class, or I use the three systems in the two two day class, I think people understand because I make a point of explaining like, hey, you know, like this is kind of standard the way these things work, or this is something that these guys do in particular because it's something that differentiates their system, and you know. Uh, they also realize, like caveat emptor, you know, they have to kind of, they have to manage that for themselves. We can't always have, there, there aren't ever going to be enough of us to manage that for every single project in the country. So that's why the idea of these programs is to, um, is to empower other people like electrical contractors. So, you know, it, it's tricky. It's a tricky thing when you're thinking about this educational stuff because he, I, we could either say we're going to have some program that's geared to a, ver a very narrow set of people that start at the bottom and go way the heck up to the top. But we can do that because we're focused on you know just one type of person: architects or lighting people and lighting firms or whatever, electrical engineers. Or we can have broad base of educational stuff, but that's going to be like mostly fundamental stuff. So that's a tricky thing from an educational viewpoint. How do you get more people advancing upwards, right? But it's hard to do if you're talking about not just a narrow group, but a big group. That's the tricky philosophical question in terms of education. So, Well, hopefully we'll see some change in the next few years. And yeah. I'm sure you will be a part of that, Steve, if it happens. So thank you so much so. For, for joining us. I really appreciate the talk. And hopefully our, our viewers and listeners got a lot out of this. Hope so. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. May the force be with you with TCPI.com. That's right. Technical Consumer Products. TCP, Greg, what do you got there? Woo! Well, you got the, it is a force because you know what? You can do whatever you want when you have the force. You can change your color just by switching right on the tube itself. Type A, type B, single, double-ended. Give your customer the flexibility of color choice. Give yourself the peace of mind and not worrying about the color choice. Let the customer decide. Easy click, move on with your day. Did you say that that tube is also type A or B? Uh, they have two options. They have a type A and a type B. Right, so they you can order it type B or you can order type A and it's double-ended type B, right? You got a bug. Oh, man. I just, the force is with us all with TCP. If you're a lighting distributor, you got to go to tcpi.com. Check out the people there. Amazing company to work with. And you know, Greg... Uh, I'm going to get to the convention. We're tied up with our class. I'm not so I'm excited about it, but it's not it's not going to happen next week. So I want all the listeners out there to know. I think the number one value of being a nailed member, Greg, it's the education, right? So everyone knows Absolutely. about LS1. LS1 yeah. isn't a known thing, but what about LS Evolve? Secret. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. That's training you can get. It's quick little hitters, and that's what you need. You don't need all these long sessions. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you just need a quick blast on a specific item, a specific topic, and that's what the Evolve does for you. 
LS Evolve is such a wonderful product, folks. It's so many experts from around the world have been generous with their time with Nailed, and they've weighed in on all these great subjects. You know, if you're a Nailed member, get your people in LS. First, put them in LS1, but once they're done that, put them in LS Evolve. Keep them on top of all the magic out there. And, of course, you know we're hot in Dallas, Texas, September 13th to 16th. We're tying it up with the Arclight Summit this year. And um, there's going to be a – just check it out. Go to Nailed.org. And, of course, may the force be with you.